So let us put down the various uh, concepts we are dealing with. One is of irreducible representation. And we want to move towards what, uh, oh, and we have defined characters which are essentially traces traces of. Uh, d alpha g. So, the irreducible representation we will denote by d and alpha is some kind of a label. Sometimes it is directly the dimension of the group or sometimes something else that characterizes that, uh, I, I am sorry, alpha is either the dimension of the representation or something else that characterizes it. And the characters are traces of the matrices D alpha, which represent elements G for G belonging to G. Okay. The representation is uh, meant to be, as we have already said, with carrier space, some linear vector space, and D alpha are matrices. So, in a representation, It almost always means carrier space, some vector space V and uh, D alpha as linear operators. Now, some people had a question last time at the end because the idea of what is irreducible was not completely clear and we had said something like uh, if there is a invariant subspace, you know if there is a, if there, if a, a space breaks up into two subspaces which remain invariant, uh, but the idea is of reducible versus irreducible. Is simply that if I have a matrix D which breaks up into block diagonal form, such that only these are non zero and all these are zero. What this means is that in any basis we have constructed uh, or so any vector we take belonging to this belongs to V and if this matrix acts on that V, it is going to take the first few only into themselves. Those components will only be mapped into those components. The next few will only be mapped into themselves and the last segment will be only mapped into itself. So, those basis vectors will never be transformed into these basis vectors or these will never be transformed into those. Okay. So, each of these is called an irreducible subspace or it is it is called invariant subspace. So, these become all invariant subspaces. of D for the time being. But the point is that if for the entire representation for all G belonging to the group, if every single matrix D that represents them 
breaks up like this, then we have some redundancy because we could have just looked at this last few components and we would have got a representation. We could have looked at this subspace and we would have got a representation. So, the idea this is called a reducible representation and when you uh, restrict yourself in such a way that there is no invariant subspace to it, then it is called irreducible. So, just to uh, repeat that or write it down a little bit, we just said that if it, it can very well happen that by accident one element happens to have some form like this, but if it happens for all the elements of G, then we call such a, re a representation reducible. We will find that for a given group, the number of irreducible representations is also limited. You cannot indefinitely keep finding newer and newer irreducible representation. If a newer representation you find, a larger one you find, it will be possible to break it up into the smaller ones which are all irreps. So, we will see that there is a limit. there are only finite number of irreps. Any larger rep will be reducible. reducible into these. And we will find that the irreps actually act somewhat like a basis. You find any general large reducible representation, you can almost represent it like a linear combination of the smaller ones. The, uh, the whole uh, problem has been transferred to linear spaces now and to linear algebra and lot of the powerful uh, results that follow from linear algebra apply. And so, we will find that there is almost like a uh, the irreps almost form a basis. I am just writing sort of because I do not see any theorem stated of that type. 
but the statements we will prove will convince you that this is what it means. In terms of which a general rep can be linearly formed. So, linearity is always a great thing because it keeps things simple. can be linearly decomposed. So, that is the general idea. Oh, thank you. So, any larger rep will be reducible. And of course, when I said larger, I meant larger than the largest irrep that exists. Okay. Uh, so, now we go back to what we were trying to do last time, which was first to prove Schur's lemma. So, we dive into a bit of mathematics for a while and then we will come out and then prove this nice uh, result that every irrep is uh, linearly decomposable. And just to make the larger connection, um, the point is that if you have any vibrational modes of a molecule, then you can analyze them by their uh, symmet th the vibrations essentially fall into some representation of the uh, symmetry group of the molecule. And if you have arbitrary vibration, then you can decompose it linearly into uh, so called normal modes of vibrations which form bases in terms of which irreps are represented. So, if you have to calculate the intensity of a particular transition, it will amount to finding out the weightage of a particular representation that is contained in the particular vibration that you have. Okay. So, if it makes, it will sound vague right now, I am just going over it quickly, but that is what it boils down to. So, you can decompose motions, ultimately there also there is some intrinsic linearity the vibrations are small. If there are large vibrations, then there will there can be non-linearity, but usually the effects that human beings can cause are small until laser science arrives. Lasers can cause non-linear effects at atomic level, but uh, otherwise all the electric or magnetic fields you can produce are so tiny compared to the intrinsic um, uh, forces, electrical and forces binding the atom that you can only make very small disturbances. So, they can be analyzed as uh, just linear vibrations. You can treat it like a harmonic oscillator in a general sense. So, linearity applies. Therefore, most of chemistry can use this kind of uh, linear representation theory. Okay, so, we come to this uh, Schur's lemma and I remember that uh, we were doing uh, this statements about so called uh, kernel of a map and I think this proof is probably the most abstract one that we are going to do. Probably this Mildred Dresselhaus's book has a better proof, but since I have not prepared for it, I will just tell you what is uh, from Hassani's book which is easier to, which is at least neat, it is clear. So, we have defined so, towards Schur's lemma, uh, the first thing was to say something about kernel of linear maps. So, first of all the definition was kernel of a map T for T which is a map from V to V prime 
or V to W let us say uh, is all elements V. So, how should I so kernel A consists of V belonging to the vector space V such that T of V is 0 vector. is the 0 vector of W. So, whatever is mapped into the 0 vector is that that set in the original set is the in the domain set is called the kernel and one of the immediate results is that uh, for a linear space the 0 on the other side is always in the map. So, for a linear map uh, is always in the range uh, so right always the image of Okay, otherwise the linear transformation properties will not work you have to add. So, you know that adding a 0 vector does not 0 is like the identity element and so if on this side if you add 0 it should not change the vector then the image also should not change. So, the on the other side also you have to have this. So, that is a very simple and obvious fact. Then the Next thing we were trying to prove was that a uh, linear transformation is 1 to 1 if and only if its kernel happens to be the 0 vector. So, in other words after all if it is 1 to 1 then it can it should take only one element into a specific element and we already have this thing here this statement here which is a little I am leaving it out it is a little obvious. So, this hap in this case it is we are trying to st state a bijection I mean if and only if statement. So, not only does it map 0 vector into 0 vector, but Conversely, if the kernel is 0 vector, then the linear transformation also has to be 1 to 1. So, the if part is sort of clear, sorry, the only if that is uh, this we have already proved. And then to prove the forward statement that the map has to be 1 to 1 if the kernel is only 0, then note that if we have two different elements, uh, 
not if. So, for two different elements v1 and v2, So, suppose that V1 and V2 are mapped into uh, the same element on the other side. What we want to prove is that that implies that V1 must be actually equal to V2 because it is a 1 to 1. But then we know that, but the kernel of T is 0. So, T V1 minus T V2 equal to 0 on the other side implies that V1 minus V2 is also equal to 0 because the kernel is V1 minus V2, right? So, it implies that T of by linearity in other words this has to be essentially 0 of 1. because that is the kernel. So, if it maps into 0, then this vector has to be 0 vector that means that V1 equal to V2. So, if image is the same, the domain elements are also the same and so that proves 1 to 1. Now, this we are going to use this lemma we are going to use for Schur's lemma and as I was trying to tell you Schur's lemma should actually have been called a theorem, but I suspect that he proved it along the lines of proving the great orthogonality theorem. So, since the or the wonderful orthogonality theorem, so because that is the bigger theorem people call this previous result a lemma. So, what is Schur's lemma? So, the statement of Schur's lemma that I may have written last time, uh, we have to emphasize that it deals with irreducible representations. such that they define irreducible representations and if there is a operator A which uh, so here the T prime is on V prime. So, the carrier spaces are different G L just means the general linear group it means the matri some matrix representation and V and V prime are vector spaces of potentially different sizes they are not the same vector space. So, we are trying to realize the group in two different ways. We have one carrier space V on which some the same size. So, if it is size n then n by n matrices can act on it 
or there is a v prime whose size may be n prime and there will be n prime times n prime n prime n prime size matrix is acting on it that would be called a map t prime of all the elements of g into those matrices so and if there is now an operator a which is from v to v prime which satisfies a t of g equal to t prime g of a for all g belonging to g so in simple language what we are saying is ultimate although we are writing this as maths there will become some representations d alpha d beta if i have two sets of representation matrices for the same group and then i find some n by m matrix which quote commutes with so it if it up it is applied to representation alpha it produces d beta times a on the other side such a has to be either trivial i mean it has to be zero or identity that is what it shows so the in other if you you can think of it another way you can try to apply a inverse on this side you know flip there is no way of converting an alpha representation into beta if they are both independent irreducible representations what that's what it means some kind of similarity trans if you seek a similarity transformation like a that doesn't i mean it's trivial it's that it's just identity element or it is actually zero there is no way of doing it and that is actually what is the significance of an irreducible representation that you cannot convert one into the other by uh multiplying it by some so given an n by n representation you will not be able to find an m by n operator acting on it which will convert it all magically into m by m representation that will become a representation that is the meaning of this statement so let me just very briefly say uh, loosely speaking oh so i didn't complete the statement so if such a exists then such a is or a is identity and t and t prime are the essentially the same or zero or so loosely speaking d alpha irrep can't be converted into d beta irrep using a linear uh, operator a of size alpha beta so well beta alpha in a sense or i should have written a beta alpha something like this right so you have to of course make sure of the domains and ranges but you cannot and the if i flip a it will become an alpha beta kind of operator so i can always apply beta alpha on d alpha and a inverse on the uh, on this side and expect to get a beta size matrix but such conversions are not possible okay uh so and that is what leads to that orthogonality it basically means that the representations contain completely independent vectors the irreducible representations so now the proof is a 
somewhat technical first it observes that uh, if a vector a belongs to kernel of a then all uh, tg acting on a also belong to kernel of a So, if everything belongs to kernel of A, it means that A is mapping everything into 0, you know belonging to the kernel of A means it is being mapped into 0. Such things in linear transformation theory are done only by 0 maps, taking a whole space and converting it into a 0 on the others in the range from domain means that that is essentially a 0 transformation. So, we are moving towards that. So, this can be seen because uh, so, let A belong to kernel of A and we take A acting on T g of A but that according to the hypothesis should be same as T prime g A on the other side on A. But that means that since this is A of this is 0 because it is kernel of A, so this is equal to 0. That means that A belonging to cur A implied that T after applying T g also it continues to belong to cur A. Now, uh, if T is an irreducible representation, then either it is a trivial map which means that it will send either it is going to send all of V into one uh, element, the 0 element or it should not do anything to it or the curve A has to be 0, 0 vector. So, I call this result star for the time being, a statement star and star. So, these are the conditions for T being in an irrep okay. and star would mean that A is essentially trivial, A is 0 map and if it is 2 then it means it is a it is a 1 to 1 map, this is where we are using that lemma. So, the strategy is to prove a map to be both injective and surjective that makes it one to one ok and in both cases it is the first option that will work out and so the first is what will happen and so we will essentially see that A is 0 yes. Okay. I just put down the fact that the hypothesis of the theorem that T is an irreducible representation basically means that uh, this A operator has to be such that 
either it takes all the vectors into 0 or uh, it it just maps uh, the 0 vector of uh, the space v into 0. So, you will see it is it is a technical proof we will come back to it after you see the whole of it. The reverse part basically now starts from the other side, part 2, let B belong to A of V, for example, equal to A of some X with X belonging to V. And now we start with because this is in the uh, A remember is a map from V to V prime. So, this B actually belongs to V prime. Now, we want to use that condition that T commutes that A commutes with T and T prime. So, T prime G acting on B is equal to T prime G A of x that is the line above B is equal to A of x, but this we can write as equal to A of T G of x, but that means that this also belongs to the image of A. So, T g of x also is uh, something that belongs to A of v. Now, again we draw, we remind ourselves of the properties of what is an irrep. that T prime is an irreducible representation implies either that A of V has to be 0 or that A of V has to be equal to V prime, all of V prime. And we put some symbols here to tally things, call this statement this and this uh, double dagger, this is what I chose once. So, now this and this are essentially same that kernel of A is all of V, every all of V is demolished by A and this is what this is basically saying. So, Whereas, if it is 2, then it means that A is actually surjective. Now, 
thus we see that a is both surjective and injective and a which satisfies the condition of the lemma that a t is equal to t prime a if such a exists then it is both injective and surjective so either it is an isomorphism which means essentially an identity matrix kind of thing or of course it can mean that t and t prime are equivalent but we will see that that's not real i mean the t and t prime will actually be the same in this case so and this means that a is either an isomorphism or a is just zero a which was from v to v prime including the case 0 well i shouldn't say including because 0 so the role of an a which quote commutes with i mean it uh, or quote purports to convert a represent a map t into t prime has to essentially be either do nothing uh, unusual or has to be just zero if it is tries to do something unusual so that is the proof i suggest that you you study it a bit if you have a question we will discuss it again later but this is a formal proof and you have to spend a little time thinking about it okay so this is the end of proof and uh, actually lot of people so proving that it is identity can be uh, a few steps more to check that if uh, t and t prime are same and a t g is equal to t g a then such a is proportional to identity so we will skip these steps we have seen the crux of the proof most of it is that and it can also be proved by some by an extension of those that reasoning and specializing to the case when t becomes t prime we can actually check that it is identity because in that case it cannot be all zero and it is bijective and injective so it will be essentially equal to uh, identity map up, up to a constant now one of the um, immediate consequences of this is that if you have an abelian group then all its irreducible representations will have to be one dimensional because if if it is an abelian group then this condition is always satisfied you can always find a t which will con i mean be, uh, you can convert a if you have an a then so if you so sort of a corollary
this can be seen from this preceding statement because Take a specific element H and take its representation. Because the group is abelian, TH will commute with any T of G. For all G. That means T of G has to be proportional to identity up to a constant. But I can play this game with every single element H of the group G. repeating this for every H belonging to G, we see that all elements of G are proportional to identity. which is then the identity matrix whatever size it is n by n is irrelevant. It is essentially the numbers that are representing those elements. The irrep is one dimensional. So that is one nice, theorem, nice uh, result that immediately follows. Uh, in case of physics, we also know that there are symmetries of the Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics. If uh, Hamiltonian H has symmetry group G, then the representation uh, for on any representation of irrep of G H has common eigenvalues. This is because H T G equal to T G H because H has to commute with elements of G, H, the G is a symmetry of H. So, H has to commute with T elements. So, this means that H must be proportional to 
some lambda times identity over that whole multiplet. So, this we usually call these degenerate multiplets. So, those are sort of the immediate consequences of uh, Schur's lemma. Okay, so, so much for Schur's lemma. We next wanted to prove the great orthogonality theorem. Actually, the proof is not very long, uh, and although it is also technical, it is somewhat less of uh, abstraction. It is a constructive proof like the proof we had about finding a unitary representation. So, this proof of got or what is quite nice and uh, it is similar in nature to that unit existence of unitary representation for every um, yeah, existence of unit finite unitary finite dimensional unitary representations. So, let me call this the wonderful orthogonality theorem. also known as great orthogonality theorem. Dresselhaus's book, uh, the one that I said I have given link today, it ascribes this to a mathematician called Van Vleck. So, I do not know, you can call it what you like. Some people just call it the, the orthogonality theorem, then it becomes taught I guess. Okay. So, in here we want to show that uh, we want to show a result of this type. Given irreps d alpha and d beta now watch carefully what we are writing d alpha i l g d beta m j g inverse is equal to. So, you take matrices from representation alpha and on the right you multiply by matrices from representation beta some other representation and then sum over all g. Note that here the sizes of d do not matter because I have kept in fact all the i, l, m, j are not summed over. So, I take a particular representation and I take another representation. I pick any one element i l from one of them and m j from the other, but now I sum over all the group elements. So, the summation is only over g. The claim is that this will result in a bunch of deltas, Kronecker deltas, delta i j. So, all g belonging to g this is equal to delta i j delta m l and delta alpha beta times. So, there is some normalization order of g divided by 
n alpha where n alpha is the size of the representation. Okay, and G is order of G, uh, the size of I mean, that group, order of the group G. So, this is the orthogonality theorem that if you take representation matrices from two different representations, you are going to get 0 effectively. If you sum over and you pick some specific elements and you sum over all G, you will just get 0 unless alpha is same as beta. So, there is a delta alpha beta unless the representations are the same and in that case you are forced to choose i equal to j this index equal to that index and if l is equal to m j uh, sorry i i l and m j i j m l this is correct yeah so i yes so i equal to j and m equal to l only then I will get a non-zero answer and that answer will be equal to the order of g divided by the size of the representation. So, it is some kind of an orthogonality relation only if various things coincide then the vector magnitude of the vector turns out to be this mod g over n alpha otherwise it is uh, all those things treating it as a so, this essentially treats these elements of the representation to be vectors of size g, the order of g, because this summation runs over g means that if you think of this as an inner product, then we are the number of quote components, the number of components is equal to the order of g. Okay. So, to prove this, one takes uh, a clever construction So, we take any any arbitrary x we like just take any such x and then construct a equal to sum over g uh, let me write it first d alpha and I will stick to this notation d alpha g and capital X d beta x inverse and sum over all x belonging to g. So, we have so far not used x for elements of g, but we will just call it this is sum is over g and since x is this alpha to beta kind of map it can act on um, alpha beta size matrices. So, it, this is a rectangular matrix which links on this side to beta representation this side to alpha representation, but now we sum over all g and construct such an A. Now, what we will use do is cleverly use Schur's lemma using this as the A that commutes with alpha and beta. So, 
So now consider hitting such an A with D alpha G. This means I take this D alpha G and bring it under these um, right inside the summation and that is why we had kept this summation index X. And now just look at the expression for A which I am reproducing here now. But now and I have D beta of X inverse. Now I multiply the right hand side by d beta g inverse d beta g this is identity right it's just taking g g inverse product and i apply it to this side so g is a constant it's some specific element where x is what is being summed over. So if I hit by d alpha g on the left, I can take this inside this summation. But additionally from the right hand side I hit by d beta g inverse d beta g where g is the same. Now you can see what has happened. So now d alpha g d alpha x because d is a representation it has to convert it into d alpha of g x and d beta x inverse times d beta g inverse has to produce d beta of x inverse g inverse which is same as d beta of g x inverse. Right. So, and now we can think of the summation to be over g times x. And we are left with this trailing d beta g. But this is nothing but this summation is nothing but our good old a is just that we have shifted the summation by multiplication by a g and I think this is where they invoke this so called rearrangement theorem. It is essentially like having rearranged all the g elements in another order. So this is same as a times d beta g. So you see what has been done d alpha g on a has been converted into a times d beta g. So we can apply Schur's lemma to this A. Okay.
and I su suspect that this is why it is called lemma because it was being used in this theorem although by itself it looks quite a powerful theorem. So now by Schur's lemma A would be would have to be 0 unless alpha is equal to beta and if A is uh, if alpha is equal to beta then it would be proportional to identity. So we can write this statement as this has to be firstly proportional to delta alpha beta because otherwise it will be 0 I mean so if alpha is not same as beta it has to be 0 and if it is non-zero then it has to be proportional to some lambda times identity matrix and this lambda may depend on the choice of x what x is will decide what this lambda is other than the, it is identity. And most often I write this, um, it is called blackboard style or something, the script 1 with size of the matrix, but right now size of the matrix is ok, so it is like dim alpha or something like that, so it is alpha by alpha. Anyway, you understand what this means. Now what we do is that we choose x such that it is its only non-zero element is L m so firstly we have already established alpha is equal to beta so all these are now square matrices and in that representation uh, in that size matrix in x set everything to 0 except one particular element L m so that will mean that I can now drop this x and just replace, so I write out the matrix multiplication explicitly, but this has only non-zero at L and M, so this implies that sum over all G belonging to G, now D alpha of G and I take some I, but x allows me to have only non-zero L element and then D beta well this is also going to be alpha but ok, d beta of m and j, g would then be equal to this undetermined lambda x times delta alpha beta and because this is identity matrix it means that it has to be it has to set i equal to j. Finally, we need to determine this lambda x so to do that firstly of course we use alpha equal to beta
use the fact that alpha is equal to beta and sum over trace over ij then on the right hand side i simply get lambda x times n alpha so i i basically get summation over this kronecker delta whose size is the size of the representation alpha so n alpha is the number of diagonal elements in the identity matrix that is equal to size of the representation whereas on the left hand side we get sum over g d alpha i l g and we have agreed now to take the same representation so and m and now i am setting i equal to j so there is summation over this i as well but this is same as so so far i wrote these out as these are just entries of the matrix matrices but once i am doing a sum i may as well bring these numbers to the left of this because it's a row column it's a matrix multiplication so i am getting basically the lm element of g inverse g but g inverse g is the identity so this is just it will be represented by identity matrix so it will be proportional to delta ml and the summation over g will just give me size of the group g what it says is sum over all the g or that is some uh, add as you have as many terms as there are elements in g but each term is just the identity matrix so it is just counting the number of elements in g this summation has collapsed because this is just equal to if you want it is equal to sum over g d alpha of the identity Uh, e but you have to do this for every g you have to count this for every g so that produces g so let me put it in quote marks this is what it boils down to so it just counts the size of g and m has to be equal to l otherwise this will be zero because this is representing the identity matrix so we got this on this side and that ends the theorem because now we put together these left hand side and right hand side equal to nx times uh, lambda x times n alpha or lambda x is equal to so putting it back
and that is the got what or taught whatever you want to call it. Gene verse, but we quickly can improve on it a little bit by observing that we will always be using unitary representations. So, G inverse will be same as uh, G star. So, for unitary reps, this becomes equal to so then it becomes just summation over G. except that I have to change the order from m j I have to write j m because u dagger equal to u inverse. So, I will use unitary rep and use it in this form. that is why I made the mistake of not putting g inverse there. So, then it actually becomes much nicer it's just summation over g no you do not have to refer to the g inverses sum over all g this is the uh, orthogonality theorem. Okay. So, this will be used to prove things such as the number of irreducible representation is same as the number of independent conjugacy classes. You can imagine the conjugacy classes in a group is finite, there are only so many conjugacy classes. And now we will be able to check that the number of irreducible representations cannot be more than that, it is exactly same as that. So, that list of irreps stops, it is also finite. And uh, that is how character tables are usually represented, they are just uh, row and columns are just ir irrep versus um, classes. Okay, so we will stop here today.